questions? Stephen Jay Gould is going joining us now. You're a prolific and very popular writer. I was amazed to see how many books you actually had in press now. What's your book total? It's about 20 books that I've written, but I wouldn't exaggerate the significance of that if you write essays every month, as I have since January 1974. They automatically accrete into books every three years or so. So nine of those volumes are collected essays from that series. They'll be a tenth and final one because I'm going to stop writing them at essay number 300 in January 2001. Oh, right. You'll be sorely missed because you are popular. And I feel like you're a man on a mission with a mission to teach us how to do evolution and think about evolution correctly. Is that one of your goals? If I have a mission, and this may sound not exactly what you expect of people, but if you ask any writer in an honest moment, nobody will tell you anything different. I write those essays for myself. Any good writer has to. That is, of course I want to. Okay. Next one. All doing very well. Yeah, for the last one, the answer was five, five years, which everyone seemed to know, except for one person. Okay, everyone done this one? Good, everyone got this right? Um, this question we asked our incoming grad students, and some of, us got, some of them got this wrong, so you're ready for grad school. Maybe you're past grad school. Who knows? Has everyone answered? All right, most of you got this one right. Isopod. So what's an isopod? What's another name, name for isopod? It's a crustacean, right? Called like pill bugs. It's looking like roly polies. Little things you running around. What's a ground sloth? Yeah. And these are yeah, they were large. One like these, you know, the small sloths that go slowly through the trees. These are giant things, you know. On the tar pits and that sort of thing. Um, Riftia? Tube worms, giant tube worms. Right, and why are they cool? Tree of feathers live in your hot vents, right? They have a symbiosis with chemosynthetic bacteria. Um, and bonobo. It's a close relative, not quite ancestor, right? It's chimps and, bono chimps and bonobos for our, sis our sister species. Bonobos are the free love ones, chimps are the violent ones. Summary of the simplification, but yeah. Good. All right, so today we're going to talk about Stephen Jay Gould. Okay, so, for, so he's important in evolutionary <coughs> biology, but it's important to realize how important he is. Okay, relative to Darwin, he's down here. Okay, so Darwin rocks, Gould rocks, but more like pebble rocks. It's smaller, okay? But he is very important, so we're going to learn about him today. Okay. <coughs> so he's most well known for writing books, okay? And so a couple of them are going around now. Um, and there's a mixture of, he had a, a monthly column in Natural History Magazine he used for explaining about various evolutionary theories, plus he also would write the dedicated books on subjects. Okay. And you can, you know, look through his writing, get a feel for his popular writing. Lots of mentions of baseball, which I always found mystifying, things like that. But you know, good at writing for popular people. Okay. So why is he important for our class? Well, three things. Popularization of evolutionary biology, helping people understand what it's about. The same way that Stephen Hawking writes about you know, a brief history of time and that sort of thing. People like, since everyone thinks they know something about string theory, right? Gould wrote about natural selection, wrote about evolution, about evolutionary processes. Okay. Um, he also developed with Eldridge the punctuate equilibrium theory. We'll talk about what that means. 
and also he was important for arguments about against pan-selectionism. So that we've, that's come up in our class already. Okay. So for a personal anecdote, when I was learning biology as a freshman in high school, I said, evolution can't be science, it's not testable. And so, you know, the same way you think, like, well, is fire life? Because, like, you know, it's, it's those arguments you get into, which is good and healthy. And so my biology teacher said, you know, shut up, go read this book. So, <coughs> hand me this book. Actually, this book isn't a, the best explanation, best example of, of evolution as science, which is history, but it was very interesting, and then it sort of spurred me to learn more and more about macroevolution. That's why, why I do what I do today, right? Um, and what this book is about is basically a history of the Burgess Shale, this, looking at the Cambrian explosion. And kind of like, how did all these things diversify so quickly, the Cambrian explosion? Okay. And so that got me really interested in science. I was a dinosaur not growing up. And then finally, I eventually ended up taking a class from Gould that he taught. And it's about like, basically the equivalent of class you're in right now, right? but better taught, um, <coughs> with a cooler field trip. But yeah, so it's really interesting to have you know, that much influence. Okay, and a lot of people are influenced in the same way by Gould. And his popular books really appeal to people who are thinking about evolution um, and they're thinking think in interesting ways. Okay, so let me give you a couple examples of his writing so you can see what it looked like. So we can read through this section. So we covered these ideas in class already, right? How, how did this come up in class? So is that the Lamarckian thing? No. Remember the chart? I don't remember what it was. Like the, 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 the passive trend stuff with McShay. Yep. Yep, so passive trends. Gould talking about a passive trend here. Right. Um, and also he's talking about the fact that life is a tree rather than a progression, right? I was in discussion with someone about science the other day, and they're talking about an ancestral frog versus a derived frog. I'm like, no, same age, right? Um, you know, you're the same. You have the same amount of evolutionary time as bacterium does, right? It's not more. It's not you know earlier than you in any sort of sense. It's been evolving for as long, right? School's communicating that to people. Here's another Gould quote. Explain what science is like. So one of Gould's major interests was sort of history of science and philosophy of science. Right, he's been called this the second most important philosopher of science, or historian of science after Thomas Kuhn. Um, and so this sort of thing of explaining like what theories are, what what facts are, is really important in communicating to the broader public. Right? I mean, we're taught in elementary school, you know, a hypothesis and test and it becomes a theory. Well, this is not actually how science works. School's very good at communicating how science works to the broader public. Okay, any questions about this? So punctuated equilibrium. So first developed by Eldridge and Gould, 1971. Okay. So they did, their paper had four main points. Okay. Point one: expectations of theory color perception. Okay. I know what that means in this context. So in this paper, they're talking about the fossil record, right? What do we know about the fossil record? It 
represents only a minute percentage of what life was on Earth. Mm -hmm. Right, it's really understandable. Good. What else do we know? Creatures go extinct. Good. Yep, so there's change. What else? Well, there's various biases, right? It's also talked about text taphonomy, right? The biases of what you see, right? And so we'll see how this comes in, how this plays a role in their theory in a second. Okay. So, paleontology's view of speciation, analytic gradualism. And what they're saying here is that in paleontology, they see fossil, fossil, you know, the different species. So here's morphology, say body size, and here's time. And they see stuff like this. And they're saying, what well, helping to interpret this is there's been this gradual shift, like that. Okay? And they interpret this you know, lack of intermediates as just, well, it's just because of the spotty record, okay? If you look more closely, you would see these intermediates, okay? And they're saying, that's what they were, that's what paleontology believes. But, allopatric speciation suggests something else. So it's allopatric speci speciation. Mm -hmm. Yep. So one species and then like a mountain range pops up, it becomes two species and they diverge. Okay. Good. <coughs> <coughs> so they're saying many breaks in the record are real. So they're saying actually what happens is you have a species evolving here, and then the speciation event. And the one that's the, the sister species that goes becomes perfectly isolated varies a lot. And it's a new trait. And then we have another speciation event, and this one changes, this one doesn't, this one goes extinct, and probably get up to here. Right, so it's a very different view of, of change, right? Change happening, you know, through time, and occasionally speciation happens, versus speciation as a cause for change. Or allowing change. Okay. Okay, so here's the rest of that their idea. Right, so they think it's green rather than the black lines. Okay, punctuated rather than gradual. So like you do now is, you know, in groups figure out, you know, arguments for or against this idea.
But more of which. <coughs> okay, yeah. All right, so there's been a question to explain it more, so let's do that and then come back to the discussion. Yeah, so here is this, so here's the idea they're arguing against, like this gradual change. You, you see this species, you see this species, you see this ancestor, and this idea that we get there through these intermediate steps, right? Or, you know, if here's the tree of life, you know, you have gradual movement, right? And they're saying, nope, what you have is this instead, right? So you have a species, and then here's the speciation event. And they're thinking speciation event mostly as sort of, the way we draw allopatric speciation is what Meyer called dumbbell allopatry. Um, you have one population, and it becomes two of about equal size, right? And what then happens more often is you know, if you're splitting something into two pieces, what's the odds of pieces being equal size? You know, if I, if I you know, split at random, many times I'll get something like this, where I have one big population and one small population, okay? And <coughs> their view is that at those times, the big population stays pretty much the same, okay? And the small population changes a lot, okay? This is originally based on ideas from Meyer about cannibalization, and so sort of organisms are sort of constrained to develop in one sort of way, but then you get a small population, you can sort of hop out of that, you can, you can sort of drift out of that canal into a different one, okay? And sort of start evolving quickly, um, and then settle back down again, okay? And so that's what you see here, so you have a big population, the peripheral isolate speciates, changes its phenotype, and then continues without changing very much. Okay, makes sense. Other questions about it? Okay, so go back to thinking about arguments or evidence for or against. Times. All right, let's let's talk to you guys as a group then. All right. What do you think? What are arguments for or against or evidence for or against? I guess against the uh, way of equilibrium would be like what kind of event, like what severity of an event would would cause the separation or the the whatever's needed for speciation. So it, whether it's geographic. Okay. All right. So that's a very good insight that, you know, in punctual equilibrium, what sets the rate of evolution is the number the speciation rate. Right? Versus just sort of the rate of environmental change or something like that. That's a good point. I mean, we don't have a lot of good evidence for speciation other than allopatric speciation. Um, there's a couple of I, there's a couple of examples of like uh, there's a palm on a small island, right? Where okay, they can they're always within breeding range of each other, but there's now two species. So what about species like in the ocean? You cannot have. I mean, I guess you can have certain specific examples like fish. You can't have allopatric fish and fish in a way to keep them apart. 
but the ocean isn't that homogeneous. And so this is one of the cool examples of the ocean of um, anyway. Um, And so there's, you know, populations that are on this side and populations on this side, right? And they're going around with big speciation like that. There's cases off the coast of California. Um, you have the ocean currents going in this way. And when they hit the coast, some go this way and then some go this way. And this actually acts as sort of a barrier where plankton from here can't get down to here. And so it's sort of it's sort of pulling it on those currents. Yeah. Yeah, I just if you've ever collected shells on both the Gulf Coast and on the Atlantic, there's complete different grouping of of the organisms you find. Yeah. Is the alcatru in the sea mostly tied to land or is there depth involved in the ocean currents? There's different basins that they think those currents affect that. But when you look at the fossil record along the coasts of any um, continent, you will have distinctly different basins even over different time periods. You'll see different assemblages of organisms and species just because of whatever processes all converge to create <coughs> different that evidence for allopatric speciation, or is that just, these are the species that are found in this basin, and these are the species that are found in this basin? But you, you do have, sometimes with the current, I study it, the sea urchins, and you look at the, the spread of the larvae of those sea urchins going to different localities. I actually look at the biogeography of um, spatangoids, and you do get coverage, you can see where they will come from, where the related species are from, but they are different and they're different species. But you, but there you have like, did these gradually change from what that was to that location, or did they come here and change because of what variety is here? So you have to look at the two. I'm more inclined to go with at the allopatric speciation. Yes, they're of the same genus, but here they are of different so that's, um, when you look at gradualism, you know, it relies on the idea of genetic of drift. But we've looked at drift models, and it's a little more difficult to, to force separate populations together. You know, sympatric speciation is a little more challenging. Well, gradualism doesn't really depend on drift. You can do it with just selection, too. But yeah, but it, I, it's still, you start to, this is a very much mechanism we can see. It doesn't mean that the, both of them don't happen, it's just we can see this one. Yeah. Another thing is like if you look at closely, if, if most species were sympatric, the closest relative to any species would be in the same area. We see more more, more common that the closest relative of a given species is in a neighboring area. Yeah. But I mean this is still an empirical question. Yeah, shoot. Um, so is it possible, this was gradual step evolution versus allopatric speciation, right? Not quite. So with this model, speciation can be allopatric. Okay. Yeah. But they're saying that, you know, between speciation events, you can still change gradually. What this is saying is that between speciation events, you don't change. You only change at speciation events. And the, you know, the pure public equivalent view. I mean, obviously, they know enough to say, okay, yeah, life is never all this or that, right? So there is some antigenetic change. But in general, I think it's more like this, where the evolution rate is independent, is dependent on the speciation rate. Because here, where the evolutionary rate is independent of the speciation rate. What else do people think?
think that a species could remain static until they have a battle capture to them. Because I mean, you've got selection occurring, so I mean, if nothing else, a species is going to look different after a bunch of generations of remaining static just through natural selection, through you know, competition or mate selection. Do you disagree with that? Or? No. Um, can I ask, has an argument been made that macroevolution is punctuated with religion, and then like, microevolution is by religion? Like, yeah, though, I mean, with the modern synthesis, you know, like those terms, I mean, this is a macroevolution class just yeah. because it's like, the cool side of evolution. But there's no, but it used to be thought that it was different processes, uh -huh. right? And now I think that it's actually the same process. Yeah. Um, except, I mean, sometimes macroevolution is defined now as like, that selection happening above this above the individual level, so like species selection or species sorting might be considered macroevolution. Yeah. I feel like you have to have a concrete definition of species to be applicable. Interesting. Why do you think that? Well, there is morphological dynamism that occurs through broad time scales within a species. And he's. I mean, he's. They're saying no. There isn't. So there's no morphological dynamism yeah. within a species. I mean, in the pure version of the theory, right? Yeah. And then they acknowledge that you can, I mean, there is some wiggling. Okay. Right. They say you have to really like, change morphology a lot. You have to have a speciation event. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, a little wiggling. Yeah. But definitely distinguish between the, you know, the magnitude of the wiggles per time for a species. Yeah. So, in my opinion, most evolution, most evolution has been studied in the name of evolution by the Alabama factor. But what about like microorganisms? Yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, so empirically, we don't have a good idea about bacterial species or speciation yet. Um, I mean, there's some ideas that, you know, given the fact that, like, all the bacteria in the aeroplankton, like, everything is sort of everywhere. It's one sort of school of thought. Which isn't, of course, true. I mean, like, the bacteria in tube worms are not also on your skin. Right. Right. And that would be but you're right, I mean, within bacteria, I mean, things are evolving very quickly without having to acquire speciation events. Yeah, so it shows, by, I mean, lots of discussions we have about phylogeny and that sort of thing are thinking about macroorganisms, you know, metazoans, and ignoring bacteria. That's a good point. The process should still occur, should apply to bacteria if it's happening. Right, but the question is, do you have to have speciation to do that first? So we just have one species of lobster. Can it itself become two morphs? And there's some evidence of that, but I'm not sure if it goes all the way to speciation. But if you can have it speciate first, but then when the two come together, then you can easily push one off, which would be, which would be a you know, punctuated equilibrium thing. Um, does the allopatric model take into account uh, plasticity? Uh, Morphologically, because if they are... The species looks 
extremely different and functions in a different way, it could still be the same species. Is there any way to account for that? So is the distinction between like the recognition of species as like actually recognizing them different things and then also the processes that lead to the variation. Yeah, I mean, so when you're dealing with, you know, fossil record, you, you ideally like the correct for plasticity, but it might be hard, right? Um, but when you're thinking about these evolutionary processes, like changing morphology, yeah, I mean, some of this could be, I moved somewhere else and now I, you know, like Daphnia, now I'm in a predator environment, so now I grow horns. That's just, just plastic response. So yeah, some of that change could be plastic. Um, but there is evidence that if you're in a place where conditions always favor one morphology, then you sort of lose the ability to be plastic. Right? Those organisms that are constituently horned in a predator environment, you know, if they lose the ability to be non-horned, but there's never a cause to be non-horned, then there's no selection against that. Right? And actually there's selection for sometimes you might get a miscue and not be horned and it actually helps you. And so there can be selection against plasticity in certain cases. So you can go from one to the other. Yeah. But thinking about plasticity as a, as a mechanism here is really good. What else? Well, how could you test this? Dishes of bacteria, right? Mm -hmm. One of them is just let them go, and the other one is put a little divider in between. Mm -hmm. And what would that tell you? I guess it would confirm that. Well, I guess it would just confirm that algae should be consistently close to both. Yeah. I mean, you could, it might be hard to do with bacteria because they're already asexual, pretty much, right? So species there is kind of a fuzzy thing, and so like you can imagine that each lineage is diverging anyway. But you could just make that sexual, like yeast, and say, okay, here I have yeast that's evolving with two niches, and I have a speciation event. What happened? Oh, that's that'd be a good test. Yeah. How else? I mean, this is still, I mean, this is something that's been debated in the literature, like, you know, it, those kinds of things have been happening for a long time, right? I mean, one thing people do do is um, actually look at, you know, if you have a high level of resolution, you can look at change of a species through time, and then change another species through time, right? And you can say, okay, you know, are these changes associated with speciation events, that sort of thing, right? Do I, or do, do, do I see a distinct jump, right? And all of a sudden I have you know, this, and all of a sudden I have now this, right? One problem with the idea is that it could be gradual, but they're in different environments, and all of a sudden this one moves over here, so now I start collecting both of them. And I see, oh, I have a sudden new morph, actually just something that moved, up, moved in. Another way this is often investigated is using phylogenetics. All right, so here's a paper that came out this year with a method. <coughs> and basically, so this sort of gradual move is known as anagenetic, anagenetic change. Okay, change that happens between speciation events. And then change that happens only at speciation events. That's sort of how we're moving on this tree. Change that happens only at speciation events is called phylogenetic. And basically, people develop models that have both processes in them. Because people, because you know, as many of you said, there's not going to be just one; it has to be both of them, right? And what you can do is say, all right, let's see which models fit best. Is it one that has both? Is it one that has just phylogenetic or just anagenetic? Okay. And what does this show? So these are sort of weights. So the more weight you have, the better that model fits. Or 
Mm -hmm. So for social behavior, what do we see? Gradual, punctuated, or both? Gradual. Why? So this has much support, this antigenic only, so it's gradual. Right? Whereas habitat type was all cladogenic only. So at speciation events, you change from one habitat to another habitat. Between you don't change that much, if at all. Okay? So here's a nice little direct empirical estimation of this. Yeah? What is that activity period? Is that like top channel versus bottom? Yeah. yeah this, is a, this is a study of primates. Oh, between these two? Yeah. I don't know the difference between those. I should check that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Are we really a little bit different in the process? I mean, this process also includes speciation. So it could be whether one's like speciation or extinction, one's just a like yield process, just speciation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because it's using a bonification of our, the thing we talked about earlier, BISI, where it uses both character change and speciation to look at evolution. Okay, so this uses both, right? So this finds that they found that for some traits, it is gradual, and for other traits, it's cleogenetic. Okay, yeah? So how do the concepts, I don't, I don't care if we still drop them yet or if I'm remembering this from other courses, how do the concepts of heterochrony work into this thing? Like, when you start in, you know, a, a lot of sea urchins, and we've seen a lot of monotony, but uh, how does that fit into this process? And yeah. So heterochrony means you develop different rates, right? So for example, for like humans is that, you know, we come out as these, you know, I mean, think about like a giraffe coming out. You know, it gets up, runs off, you know, it's a few minutes, a few minutes of infancy, right? Whereas humans come out, you know, you're not gonna run off and do anything. Right? This is a long period of incompetence, right? Extends through, you know, college. And <coughs> All during that time, you know, the brain is still developing and the body's developing, the body's growing at a faster rate, right? You come up with this huge head, scrawny body, right? You worry about snapping your kid's neck and stuff like that. Just like half head, half body, right? And later, you know, our heads are much smaller, proportionally. And so the idea that relative to chimps, what's happened is we sort of sped up getting out of the womb and then we develop at different rates. This is a heterochrony developing. And this juvenilization of keeping these juvenile features of like a soft head for a while to keep growing it is neoteny, right? And so how does it relate to this? Well, <coughs> those processes are just ways of changing, right? In the same way that changing your body size is a change, mm -hmm. right? So it's sort of orthogonal to this discussion, okay. right? So what, does change happen at speciation events or gradually? Or does, is, one, is one question, the opposite question, and the orthogonal question is, you know, how does change happen? Is it neoteny or is it some other process? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good question. Okay. Um, and here we see just some plots of the various rates. And so we see, you know, a rate of antigenetic change here, you know, um, for habitat type, you know, we have high estimates of cladogenetic change. Okay, because everything else with the rates are very small for that. Okay. So this is a way of sort of empirically measuring this. Now, one thing to note is that every such test has been done using a sort of bastardized version of punctuated equilibrium, right? Because the ver true version is at a speciation event, one thing changes, one thing stays the same, right? The way it's actually implemented is that at a speciation event, both can change. But between species events, neither changes, right? Because it's much easier to implement this than that. It's sort of, you know, Thinking about areas where you can contribute to biology, developing this model, you know, because you can see they get a different, different answer than using this model. Right? No one's done this model yet. Okay. Questions about punctuated equilibrium? So, the basic conclusion from that is there's some evidence for it, because you hear, but there's also lots of evidence for gradualism, too. Okay. Okay, pan selectionism. About this. So 
A lot of you have read the Scandals paper, right, for the evolution class. Okay, and so here is the abstract of that. So what are they saying here? What is adaptation as program? <clears throat> so the traits are saying that they are seen. The traits did that. Traits evolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not quite intended like the external intent, but yeah, it's trace revolved for their current purpose. And so, you know, why do you have this little membrane between like your thumb and your forefinger, right? So in an adaptations program, you'd say, well, maybe you don't, maybe you don't have your fingers on, but maybe you'd say, okay, it has to so serve some purpose. Maybe it helps you gather a few more berries. It helps you swim a little bit faster through the water, right? Whereas Google ones are saying, well, we should look at other explanations too. It's just that skin's stretchy, right? Maybe it's, you know, your ancestor were, was wet, but then it serves no purpose here, but, you know, at this point there's very little selection for making it smaller, okay? So that sort of, you know, do you always have to go, you know, is adaptation the null hypothesis or not, basically? Because they, they agree that adaptation happens, natural selection, they definitely agree on that. Whether that's the null, is that everything you see you must explain by this, or do you think that's something that you have to prove separately is, is a big debate. Okay, it's like their T-Rex example. Right, T-Rex little tiny claws. Right, a lot of work on like, you know, how strong are T-Rex claws? Could T-Rex beat you arm wrestling? You know, was it using mating rituals, that sort of thing. But they're saying, well, you know, possibly there's, there's vestigial organs. Right, so you don't have to argue for why they're useful. Okay. Another part of this is the idea of contingency. Okay, so, um, if everything's sort of evolving towards a certain track, then sort of the world is predictable, right? You can get, get where we are now. Um, one of Gould's big points was that you could replay the tape of life. And a tape is like an old like audio format, you can, or video format, like a DVD sort of. Um, if you could re replay it again, right, it would come out differently. Okay? And this is one of his strong views. And this is emphasized a lot in this book, right? So, you know, the ancestor of us is this little critter here, right? And if this little critter did not make it, then we don't have things with backbones. We would have, you know, giant arthropods roaming the earth and teaching lectures or something, right? <coughs> and so goes saying, you know, so if life were rerun, you wouldn't see that. But other people say, well, sure it would, okay? So, Simon Conway Morris, so a lot of that Gould's interpretations of the Burgess Shale came from this guy when he was a grad student. He then changed his mind and started fighting with Gould. Okay. And it's good to change your mind as a scientist as long as you're changing it to improve. Right? But, um, <coughs> so Conway Morris is arguing about convergence. So what's convergence? Right, so we gave the example of ichthyosaurs and dolphins having a dorsal fin. Right, you have something that's a monitor lizard, something that's a cow, they both evolve fins in their back. And how do you get there? Yeah? Isn't that previous statement by Gould just a pathological fallacy anyways? Why? Because who's to say that that same thing would evolve like to encourage evolution? You can't say this is like this just because of this, but you can say lots of other things happen. Right, so, how, so I mean, so how would you test it? 
Mm-hmm. I mean, that's like logic in the system of logic fallacy. Well, I don't, I don't follow that. I, I don't know I logic well, but. That's, just, that's one of the fallacies. I'm pretty sure that you can't say something and it wouldn't happen if it was necessarily logically determined. But I think he's just saying that I need to have to consider it might not happen ever. He's not saying it wouldn't happen. It might not have happened yet. But, but I think here he's even. This uh, Morris guy is, is bringing up the idea of convergent, convergent evolution. You know, we're going to find form and fun, creatures with similar forms and functions in one another. Location. It's, we, see, we, see, we see convergent evolution throughout the history of this planet. So, but yes. Not a backbone, but it has a notochord. And yeah. So, and, and but you should be talking more about this. I don't understand what you're saying, really. But I'd like to. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. You you agree? So here's a gold set. <laughs> So the way I interpret this mostly is like a scale dependent, right? So um, certain things like if like you know herbivory and predation evolve multiple times, right? And so you know if you know we knocked out one clade of herbivores, another clade would take their place, right? So in that sense, there's convergence. But things like eyes, you know, we think evolved once, right? At least at least photosynthesizing cells evolve once. Right? That's why we had these deep homologies between. Drosophila hox genes and mammal hox genes, right? <coughs> so in that sense, if that ancestor hadn't evolved, you know, if that hasn't hasn't evolved ever, right? So in that case, it's you know, one you know between one and zero over you know, you know three billion years of evolution, you know, seems pretty good chance of it not evolving if you could rerun it, right? So that's how I reconcile those dates. What, what do you what do you think? I understand the question. You're saying if we were to rerun life, mm -hmm. we would not evolve. Right, so the question is like, would would you know humans evolve? Would it be very similar, or would you you know, you know, by chance something happened to be all, all male one generation and that dies out, right? And then you wouldn't have that whole lineage, or you know the rocky hill dinosaurs you know missed, right? What would happen? Would, it, would we still have had you know similar extinction at that time? Probably not. 
we still have the same sort of biota now as we do as we do, maybe. I mean, here's some stuff my lab's doing right now, actually, to like test this. So what we did is estimate certain parameters from the, from about flower evolution, and then basically we just simulate life again multiple times, and see, okay, if we could rerun flower, flower, floral evolution, we still have as many orchids as we have today, right? And so we find that like, you know, so you see which models work best. We find like here's the number of, orc of you know, not, not orchids, but similar of a certain morphology we see today is that we would simulate. So you see lots of variation in how many there are, right? Any chances that it could something like us get involved? But it hadn't until us, right? But it's just very, very recently. But, I mean, under that same rule of thinking, instead of dinosaurs, we could have evolved millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. You can make the argument for either one. Yeah. So we're, we're thinking about how to test it. If I should let people go, it's time. If you want to talk afterwards, we can. Well, part of the evolution of life, though, is also dictated by the planet it's on. And if you look at the sequence of the complexities of what shows up at different times, there's, a, there's forces there that act on that that we have to take into account. Humans couldn't have evolved at the time of the dinosaurs unless we had different breeding structures to handle the, the low amount of oxygen at that time. Period. That's why dinosaurs have certain breeding structures that now birds have that allow them to breathe more efficiently. So you would have differences in form there. So you have to block taken. There's anything about interesting things about like you know reproducibility of evolution as a process, right? And how much can you can you predict from it, right? Did you get into like chaos theory though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you have a million chimps typing up the genetic code over a million years, <laughs> one of them is going to type the human genetic code. <laughs> <laughs> what you think about it as like sort of a, a, like so. Human intelligence is rare, right? So think about like some sort of exponential process describing how frequently it happens, right? So like you know, it's like how can you get a three-car pile up on the highway? Well, you know, you observe one, it gives you an estimate of like okay, the highway's been built 40 years ago. We've had one since then, so it gives an estimate of the rate. So then you say okay, let's let's just use that process and re-evolve the the highway. When should I have have my next accident or my first accident? And there'll be a huge variation around that. Right? So yeah, so maybe I mean so. It's taken, so the Earth is going to be gone, and you know, it's, it's it's half half you know Earth's age is half up, right? It's middle age. I remember the first lecture about like history of life and how like the sun's going to expand and kill everything. And so it took half about half the age of the Earth to get to us, right? So you rerun re re it, you know, it could take us it could take three quarters of the age, it could take a quarter of the age, it could take you know one and a half times the age. In which case you're you don't get there. Maybe. <laughs> well, there's an election coming up. You can, you know, vote your mind. <laughs> <laughs>